Um, so, uh, on behalf of the Labor and Public Policy section, I would like to welcome you all to this distinguished speaker lecture with Bo Honre. Um, just a few words about Bo, who obviously does not need an introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. <laughs> so, uh, Bo Honre is class of 1913 professor of political economy and professor of economics at Princeton University. He served as chair of the Department of Economics, and he's also been director of graduate studies and graduate admissions, and chair of the Gregory C. Chow Econometric Research Program. He earned his PhD at the University of Chicago in 1987, and already in 1995, he was elected fellow of the Econometric Society. He has been past associate editor of Econometrica, Journal of Econometrics and Econometric Theory, and currently he is associate editor of the Scandinavian Journal of Economics. He's been continuously fu uh, funded by the National Science Foundation since 1988. He was awarded the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship in 1993 and the Richard E. Quant Teaching Prize in 2012 and 2018. Bo has always maintained strong ties to the research community in Denmark. For five years, he served as past uh, member and vice chair of the board of trustees of the Danish National Research Foundation, the Grundforskningsfond. Perhaps many people do not know this, but he grew up just outside the nearby town of Anas, and uh, he is still a staunch supporter of Anas FC. <laughs> But perhaps you don't know that he started out his higher education here at Aarhus University in the Math Econ program. So as a bachelor student, he was RA, research assistant for the giants of our department at that time, Henning Bunzel, Sven Hüllerberg, Lars Moos, Peter Pedersen, and Nils Westergaard Nielsen. At their encouragement, Bo attended the historic Sandbia conference of 1982, where he met Dale Mortensen and later James Heckman and Bert Singer, who encouraged him to pursue a PhD in the US. But since that time, he has kept in touch with Aarhus University. He's a member of the IS, Aarhus Institute of Advanced Studies. And in 2017, AU awarded him the Remo and Karl Hulse Knudsen Award for Scientific Research, which is one of Denmark's oldest and most prestigious prizes given for achieving significant research results in science. Bohanre's research area is microeconometric theory and methodologies, but with an emphasis on developing methods for applied economists. His publications appear in the topmost journals of our field. He has six articles in Econometrica, and he has also articles in Review of Economic Studies, Journal of Econometrics, and many others. He's contributed to the identification and estimation of duration models with unobserved heterogeneity and competing risks, um, to censored, truncated, and turbid regression, panel models with fixed effects, dynamic discrete choice models, least absolute deviation methods, and the bootstrap. We are very pleased that Bo Henry is visiting his very first alma mater, Aarhus University, in the department. He's been here since February 25th, and he'll be here until March 22nd, He's sitting in L207, and you're very welcome to stop by and chat with him. Today's lecture is entitled, Selection Without Exclusion, which frankly sounds quite appealing to applied economists like myself, who often struggle with exclusion restrictions. The talk will last up to an hour, and then there will be time for questions at the end. And following the talk, there will be a reception in, in the corridor next to the aula. So, it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Bo Honoré. Thank you very much. Let me start off. So, let me start out by thanking the department and the Dale Mortensen Center for hosting me this month. It's great to be back. Um, August is so much nicer than it was in, I left in 83. Um, so, um, what I want to talk about today is, it's really, I'll, I'll focus on a particular paper, but it's really a bigger research program, and you'll see that 
there's a lot to be done after this paper. This is the first paper we're writing on, on this topic. Uh, it's joined with Lu Jia Hu, who is at the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And if you're curious, we, you can find the paper at this link here. Okay? Okay, so, to set the stage, um, this is, okay, so let me set the stage by thinking about an experiment in Tennessee that's been studied a lot. There was an experiment where kindergartners, first graders, and second graders were randomly assigned into different types of classrooms. Okay? And simplifying things a little bit, uh, there, were three pe there were three groups, but let's just think about two groups. One group of students were assigned to a regular classroom. Nothing funny going on there. It's just like everything else. Could be me. Um, and then another group of students were assigned to a smaller classroom. And then lots of people have written papers looking at the difference between these groups of students. How did they do? And in particular, Alan Kruger and Diane Whitmore looked at how did they do later in life. In particular, how did they do when they took standardized tests that they needed to take to get into college? Right? So the question is, does it have a long-term effect? Does it does it have a long-term effect that you get randomly assigned into a small classroom as opposed to a regular classroom? And here is the distribution of test scores. It turns out in Tennessee, most students take the ACT. I won't tell you what it is, but it's a, it's a standardized test. Here's the distribution of, of test scores for the students who are put into a regular classroom. And here it is for the students who are put into a small classroom. Right? And if we were teaching like stats one or something like that, you would say, let's calculate the average over here. Let's calculate the average over here and compare the two means and we'll be good, right? The problem is that not everybody takes this test. In particular, of the students who are assigned to a regular classroom, only 32% of the students actually took the test because the rest didn't want to go to college. And of the students assigned to a small classroom, only about 35% actually took the test, right? So if you didn't want to put any structure on this, you would say, well, in principle, these could be completely different people. It could be that the people who took the test after having been in a regular classroom would not have taken the test if they had been in a small classroom, and vice versa. Is it falling off? Yeah. Sorry. I can't stand still. Sorry. <laughs> Good? Yeah, for now, anyway, we'll see. Um, so it could be that these are completely different people. It could be that when we compare these people to these people, it's like comparing apples and oranges. If you're not willing to put any structure on this, there's really nothing we can say, right? So, of course, we are not the first people to have pointed this out. They pointed it out. And people have thought about this. People have thought about this going back to, at least back to the 70s. And Jim Heckman was not the only person talking about this, but Heckman is kind of the person who's associated with this literature. Right, so Jim, what Jim Heckman did, kind of, uh, he, he thought about this in the linear regression context, right? Y star is some outcome we care about. We want to know what is the effect of X on Y star. So we specify a linear regression model. Beta is the object of interest. The problem is we don't always observe Y. It's just like before, we don't always, not everybody takes the ACT test, so we don't know the test score for everybody. And what Jim Heckman did was he said, well, let's put some structure on this. And in particular, he assumed that there was some discrete choice that determined whether Y is observed or not. So Y star is observed. It's Y when the outcome of some discrete choice model comes out of one, and otherwise it's not observed. Okay? And, um, right, and so that's what he did. And when you look at it, right, it's clear that some of you are old enough to have actually studied this. Um, it's kind of old, many of you will think of this as old fashioned, but it's clear that the spirit of this is, is kind of prevalent in a lot of areas of economics. Like the idea that people self-select here, people self-select into being observed or not being observed is something that shows up all over the literature. Like the whole literature on program evaluation is full of, I mean, that's kind of the, one of the key problems in this literature is that the idea that people self-select. So this is a little bit old-fashioned, but it's clear it has ties to a lot of stuff that's in a lot of different areas of, of economics, you know, past and current. All right. So what Jim Heckman did was he 
said, well, let's assume that these errors, the nu and the epsilon, let's assume that they're jointly normally distributed. Then we can write down the likelihood function. Of course, if they are jointly normally distributed, then that's the best you can do, and you run with that. Turns out that that's a pain to do in practice, so he also proposed a two-step estimator, which I'll talk about in a, in a few slides, because it plays a role for what we're doing. But he assumed joint normality. Then in the 80s, um, people started worrying about, in all kinds of nonlinear models, people started worrying about these distributional assumptions. Well, what if you assume normality and the errors were actually not normal? Then you would have missed specification. And then you ask yourself, are there other estimators that you could use that don't assume joint normality? And in particular, Jim Powell, there are a bunch of people wrote papers on this. Jim Powell wrote the paper that I think most people refer to where he proposed an estimator that works without normality. He needs to assume that the errors are independent of the explanatory variables, but you don't need to assume that they're jointly normal. The problem is that in his paper and all the other papers that were written on this, one needed to assume that there is a variable in set, there's a variable that has an effect on selection that is not in X. Okay. Right, so if you're an applied person, you might say, well, the commentaries assume all kinds of stuff, right? Fourth moments here and fourth moments there, and we just ignore it and we run with it. But the problem is that it actually matters in this case here, right? This is not just some technical assumption that people make for convenience. It actually matters, okay? Um, it matters theoretically, and people have written about that. But it also matters in practice, right? So in particular, this paper by uh, Alan Kruger and Diane Whitmore that I mentioned before, they actually estimate a Heckman sample selection model and they say explicitly that they assume normality as there is no exclusion restriction, right? So they, they say that we cannot credibly exclude any of the explanatory variables from the outcome and assume that it has an effect on the selection. Because of that, they need to assume normality. All right, so that's good. Um, but of course, you still have this problem that you worry that your results are dri driven by the normality assumption. So they also derive bounds on the parameter of interest. Okay? Then a few years later, David Lee came around, and David Lee essentially wrote down. Okay, he, this is a good paper, I don't want to sound, cri sound critical. But he essentially cleaned up this paper by kind of writing down formal assumptions and formally proving that under the assumptions that he wrote down, what, are the, what is the sharp bounds, what are the best possible bounds you can get on the parameter of interest. Okay? So that's what he did. Okay? So there's a sense in which he answered the question. He wrote down a set of, set of assumptions. And then under those assumptions, he said, these are the best bounds we can get on the parameter of interest. We're done. The problem is, and he did this in a very general, very non-parametric setting. The problem is that when people try to do this, they find that you, you, you estimate these bounds, and they are so wide that you really can't say anything. Okay, so this is a, a quote from, actually a quote from the paper that got us working on this project here. Um, and it says, unfortunately, the Lee bounds are quite wide and largely uninformative. Okay, and I should just say, just Right, so Lisa Barrow is a colleague of my co-author, and C.C. Rouse is a colleague of mine, and so that's how. So we were talking about our colleagues' work and said, well, it's really too bad, but they can't do this. And so we got to think about it. Okay. So what we want to do is we, so at the end of the day, right, you think about what we do. We really want to come in, pretend we're in the 90s, and come in between these literatures here, right? Because this is all great. You do all this great stuff, and under assumptions, you can parameter estimates and everything is great. But then once you start relaxing assumptions, then you end up with these bounds that are so wide that they're uninformative. So we want to come in in between and say, well, you know, is there room in between where you can make some additional assumptions here, but not quite go, you know, additional assumptions here, but not quite go up here, because we know we don't have exclusion restrictions in practice often. Is there, some, is there something in between that could be useful? And that's where we want to, that's what this paper is about. Okay. This project is about, this project is really about filling in the gap here. 
And in particular, what we want to do in the paper I want to talk about now, what we do is we take the Heckman sample selection model, and then we can argue about later whether that's too old fashioned, and that's why we want to write more than one paper on it, right? So um, we take the Heckman sample selection model, we say, let's get rid of normality because we don't buy that anyway, and let's face up to the fact that we don't, often don't have exclusion restrictions, and then ask ourselves in that model, what could we say about the parameter of interest beta? Right? And in particular, is how does what we can say in that case, how does it compare to these Lie bounds that were thought of as being largely uninformative in some, at least in some empirical papers? Are ours actually narrower? Okay? And then, so that will be like just playing around with distribution functions, and then we'll talk about how do you turn that into an estimator and how to, how to make it useful in practice. Right? So that's what it's about. Okay. Now, I need to just do a little bit of review of old econometric stuff, and you know, depending on your age, you will like this, or you'll think it, whatever. Um, um, I just, but but we, we, it, we, we kind of have to just set the stage here, right? So what Heckman did was, as I said, one of the things he did was he assumed, ah, okay. um, he assumed joint normality of epsilon and nu, and did maximum likelihood, but he also, he also observed that when you think about the expected value of y conditional on y being observed, so d equal to 1 here is just a 0, 1 variable. d equal to 1 means that y is observed. Conditional on d equal to 1, the mean, of course, is just x beta plus the mean of epsilon conditional on nu greater than, conditional on set gamma plus nu greater than 0. So that's just a function of set gamma. And with the assumption of joint normality, we know what the functional form here is, and then he used that. Right? And then uh, with the joint normality, you can estimate gamma just by a probit. So we can pretend we know this. We know this functional form. So we just put this in as an additional regress up there. That's what Heckman did. Okay? What Jim Powell did was he also worked with this equation here. But what Jim Powell did, he said, suppose you could identify two people in the population who have the same, right, again, even without, sorry, even without joint normality, you can estimate gamma, you can estimate this gamma here consistently. Right? You can only estimate it up to scale, right, because if you don't know the distribution of nu, you could always multiply beta by seven and multiply nu by seven. So there's a scale normalization there, but except for scale, you can estimate gamma, and what Jim Powell pointed out was that if you can identify two people in the population who have the same value of set gamma, right, we can estimate gamma, so in principle we could do this, then if you look at the difference in the y's for those people, the mean of that difference would be the mean of the x betas plus the difference in, the, in this, but they have the same set gamma, so that's just zero. So what's, that's what Jim Powell pointed out. And then he turned that into an estimator by saying, of course, we can, in practice, find people where these are exactly equal to each other. But we can find people where they're close, and then we can do it asymptotically so that as the sample size increases, we pick up people who are closer to closer, and pr then proves that that works. Okay? All right, so that's his estimator. The problem, and again, this is the motivation for this research I want to talk about, the problem is that when you think about this regression here, if set and x have the same elements, if there's no exclusion restrictions, if there are no variables that go into set that don't go into x, then conditional on these being equal to each other, this will not have full rank. If set is equal to that will not have full rank. Right? It's true. It sounds intuitively right. Okay. Um, so that is, so that's why that's in red down here. That's exactly why, why we're writing this paper. It's because you cannot do this trick or other tricks if you don't have an exclusion restriction. Okay. So, all right, so what do we do? Well, before I tell you what we do, let me just tell you what David Lee would do in his paper. And again, I don't want to dump on David Lee's, I mean, he's a colleague of mine, so um, I don't want to dump on his paper because given the assumptions that he writes down, he gets the sharpest bounds, okay? So if you like his, if you don't, if you like his assumptions and no other assumptions, then you have to like what he comes up with, right? So, okay. Um, oops, no, sorry. 
Sorry. Let me read this. There's one slide in between. So, okay. So. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so this is what motivates us. Before I tell you what David Lee does, let me just, there's one preliminary step saying. So we want to look at a sample selection model where the, the variables going into the selection are the same as the explanatory variables ha here. Okay? And the way we thought about it, and I, the way I think it's easiest to think about it, is to say, well, if we can't say something in the case where there's just one explanatory variable and it's 0 or 1, if we can't say anything in that case, then we probably can't say anything at all. Right? That's like the simplest possible case. So let's start thinking about the case where x is a 0 or 1 variable. Okay? So if you're into programming relation, think about x as either you're treated or not treated. Okay? Um, so x is just a 0 or 1. The variables going into selection is the same as the one that goes into the outcome. So that's also x. You can only identify the coefficients down here up to scale. So they're so just normalize it to be 1. So there's no coefficient here. Okay? Um, right, so that's a setup. In this setup, the selection is monotone in the sense that if you look at two people who have the same value for nu, and if one has x equal to 0 and, is up, and y is observed, then for that person, y would have also been observed if x is equal to 1. Right, so the selection is monotone here in the sense that if you observed when x is equal to 0, you would have also been observed if x is equal to 1. Now, OK, so this is now where I want to tell you what David Lee did, because I want to contrast what he does with what we do. So what David Lee says is, OK, suppose you have two samples, one for x equal to 0, one for x equal to 1. There's sample selection. So for each of those two groups, you don't always observe y. So if for each of these two groups, there's some probability that you don't observe y. And then when you do observe y, there's a density. Right? So this is like the density when x is equal to 0. This is the density when x is equal to 1. They don't integrate to 1 because there's probability mass at y not being observed. Okay? So they integrate to the probability that y is observed. What David Lee says is he assumes monotone selection. So he assumes that everybody who has an observed y when x is equal to 0 would have also been observed when x is equal to 1. But there are some people who are observed when x is equal to 1 who would not have been observed when x is equal to 0. Okay. So when you think about like, the people who would show up, the types who would show up in this curve and this curve, there are kind of more people in this curve and this curve here. But everybody who is observed when x is equal to 0 would have been observed if x had been equal to 1. So what that means is if you want to compare these two, we have to throw away some of the observations when x is equal to 1 to make them comparable. comparable right? Now, we don't know which ones to throw away. It could be the people in the middle. It could be the people out here. It could be the people out here. But of course, if you want to construct bounds, you say the extremes are that all the extra people when you have x is equal to 1, they are the big y's. That's one extreme. And the other extreme is that they're the small y's. And then that's how David Lee constructed his bounds. Right? He says, worst case scenario is the extra people that you get when x is equal to 1, they're all the big y's, or they're all the small y's, and then we can come up with bounds. So this is what David Lee does. What we do instead is we say, we look at, here's the sample selection model. And what we say is, OK, there's a joint distribution of epsilon and nu. We don't know what it is, but there is a joint distribution. So that's what, kind of what I have over here. These are supposed to be the contours. This is nu, and this is epsilon. Okay. Now, if there was no sample selection, this would be the joint distribution of epsilon and nu. Now, there's sample selection. So what happens when x is equal to 1? We lose all the draws of epsilon and nu for which nu is less than minus 1. We lose all the ones where 1 plus nu is negative. So it's like saying we lose the ones that below the blue line. Now, if you think about the marginal distribution of epsilon, we start out with the black one, which is the one without selection. And then when x is equal to 1, we lose some. We lose all the epsilons that correspond to nu less than minus 1. When nu is 0, we lose the same ones, but we lose some additional ones. 
right? So what that means is we start out with this distribution here, and then we lose some when x is equal to 1. We lose more when x is equal to 0. So intuitive, so it's clear, right, when you look at these plots here, since we start out with this one and then we lose some and we lose some, it must be the case that the dashed blue line is above the dashed red line because the difference between the ones correspond to having lost these epsilons here. Okay, now that's a pretty graph, but is it useful? Well, it's kind of useful, right, because we don't observe the epsilons, but we observe the y's. But when x is equal to 0, y is epsilon, right? And when x is equal to 1, epsilon is just y minus beta, OK? So we can make this. This is a statement about the distribution of epsilon, but we can make it into a statement about the distribution of the, of the observed y's. It's a statement that includes the true beta, so it'll be informative about beta. Right? Now, before I do that, let me just point out that you know, these densities are nice. But of course, I can also state them in terms of, I mean, they're pretty to look at, but I can also state, state them in terms of probabilities, right? This says the probability of being observed and y, the probability of being observed and y being in some interval, that probability, no, sorry, the probability that y is observed and epsilon is in some interval, that probability is higher when x is equal to 1 than when x is equal to 0 for all intervals that I want, might want to look at. That's the idea. So here it is, this, here, that statement in terms of the epsilons. And then, of course, when x is equal to 0, epsilon is y. When x is equal to 1, epsilon is y minus beta. So this says the true beta must satisfy this, in, this inequality here for all intervals c1 to c2. So this, this now, if you come around and say, I think beta is 7, I would just say, let's try 7. Let's calculate these probabilities here. And I say, whoops, nope. I reject this here. So beta could not have been 7. Right? So this gives us a way to try to think about estimating, or at least ruling out some betas just based on this. Right? OK? Um, here I've stated in terms of probabilities. Here I've stated in terms of densities. The problem is you, you get cleaner proofs out when you state things in terms of probabilities. And it's easier in terms of programming and stuff like that. But it's easier to explain. You know, intuition is easier to get across with densities, right? Because you can plot them nicely. Right? All right. And so again, looking at uh, this is just the same sil silly picture that I had when I illustrated Lee's bounds. Right? What, what David Lee would be, do is he would say, to compare this to this, Let's cut off either the right tail or the left tail of this distribution here and then compare the means. What we do instead is we say, well, the true beta is a beta for which when we shift this line here by beta, it will be below this line. So we take this guy here and we say, how far do we have to shift it until it's below this line here? And for any beta where it's not below, we can rule those betas out. So the betas we can't rule out is, so here we just shift, 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 shift. Now it's under, keep shifting, 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 and then it goes out on the other end, right? So the, so the betas that work are the, beta, are the shifts corresponding from here to here. And this is a silly example where these guys are jointly normal, but the point of this graph here, well, the po part of the point is just to illustrate what is it we do, about what is our strategy, and is to exploit this kind, this kind of relationship, but also to show you that the bounds we get out of this are quite a bit narrower than the bounds that David Lee got out. And if that wasn't the case, right, then we should have stopped working on it when we got to this point here. Right? The whole point is to come up with something that is more useful than what David Lee did. Right? That's it. All right. Then we, OK, so of course, it's pretty clear, if, unless I mumble too much, it's pretty clear right, that the true beta must satisfy this relationship here, but maybe there are other relationships that the true beta must also satisfy that, I ha that I'm ignoring. So maybe, I, maybe somebody could kind of say, well, there, there are some other restrictions that you're not using, so maybe you could do better. And so we have a theorem that says, no, actually, this is the sharp identified region. You know, given 
the assumption that the errors are independent of the x's, x here is just a zero one. Given that assumption, any beta in this region here could have been the true, could have been the true beta. There's an underlying distribution of nu and epsilon. For each beta, there's an underlying distribution of nu and epsilon that would have given you exactly the distributions that you observed. Okay, so that's a theorem, right? So these are the best, this is the best possible region. All right. Um, just for fun, I, we did it. We looked, this is, a, this is the Kruger-Whitmore example. Um, and again, our idea for thinking about what is, the true, what is the true beta, what is the effect of being put in a small classroom, in this example would be, by how much do I have to shift the distribution of the regular classroom kits so that it is always under the small classroom kits, right? And if you look at it, I mean, these are estimated, right? So I'll talk about that, right? So you shouldn't take this over here too seriously because there's a lot of estimation over here, over here right, out in the tail. But basically, right, when you look at the red curve, you can't shift it to the left because then you clearly violate that it's below over here. So that says the effect is probably not negative. And you can shift it a little bit to the right if you ignore this over here, but not very much. So this kind of suggests that the effect of being in a small classroom is not negative, but not very big, right? So, right? Um, I use this example here just because, well, anyway, uh, because this is one of the, this is kind of the literature that got us excited about this. The literature historically where this has been used a lot is in labor economics, estimation, estimation of wage equations. So just to be in line with that, what we, what we did, the, the empirical example that we actually carry through in the paper is let's try to think about the wage difference between Hispanics and whites in the US, okay? And I should have a reference here to a guy called Moore because it's his idea really. Um, so what we do is we look at third generation Mexican Americans. So these are people who are self-identified as Mexican Americans and who has at least one grandparent who was born in the US. Okay? So we want to look at third generation because the idea is when you say Mexican American, you don't know is it, you know, what is it? Is it language skills or whatever? And by looking at third generation, you're kind of trying to, you're getting rid of a lot of those effects, hopefully. Right? So that's what we do. And we look at the states that border Mexico, Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas. Um, we look at men and women. We look at wages. Turns out that for both men and women, for both Hispanics and non-Hispanics, not everybody works. Hispanics work more than non-Hispanics. Um, so if you wanted to compare the wages of Hispanics to whites and you wanted to allow, think about sample selection, you say, well, they don't all work with the same probability, so we need to think about possible sample selection bias. And here, so here, this is for the females and this is for the males. Let's just look at the females over here, right? This is the observed distribution for the whites. This is the observed distribution for the Mexican-Americans. And our estimate of the effect of being Mexican-American would be by how much can I shift this line here so that it is under the black line, All right? And I don't want to talk about inference yet, but here I just eyeballed it and say, well, if you shift it like my, by minus 0.11, then it's below. You can't really shift it by more or less without getting outside. So our estimate would be 0.11 here, right? Minus 0.11, and these are log wages, right? All right. Um, yeah, okay. So now at this point you say two things. You say, maybe you say many things. Maybe you say, I don't buy this model at all. And then I'll say, you know, come back for, for the next paper or something like that. But, but maybe you say that. Um, but, you, but two other things you might say, even if you like it up to this point, you'd say, well, but I mean, nobody estimates a sample selection model where there's just one explanatory variable and just zero or one variable. That's just silly, right? You'd always want to control for other things. So I'll, we'll talk about that in a second. The other thing you say at this point is, well, this whole idea, right, it's kind of, it compares densities or probabilities of all intervals, which is kind of the same thing. But it's clear, right, these densities out in the tail would be very precisely, uh, imprecisely estimated 
So judging whether one, est one density is above another estimate out in the tail, it's going to be hopeless, right? Because you'll be estimating some imprecise so imprecisely that one could be just above or just below just because of estimation error. So in practice, what we do, one thing you might want to do in practice is say, let me not look at densities, but, and let me not look at the probability of every interval. Let's just look at a finite number of intervals, like deciles. Okay? Um, and just, that's what I say here. Don't try to read it. I just want you to look at these numbers here. If you go in my silly example, which is the, you know, the example I carry through where, where the, everything is jointly normal, in that case, by going from the sharp, by going from the sharp identified region to this non-sharp identified region where I just look at deciles, I don't lose that much. That's, that's the point of this slide. So in practice, that's what we'll do. I mean, the, the theory is about these densities, and, or I, either about these densities or about all probability every interval. But in practice, you just look at a finite number of intervals. And, you don't, and what I want, the point of this is that you don't lose that much. All right? All right. Now, OK, so as I said, this is kind of silly. I just talked about the case where x is one dimensional. x is one dimensional, 0, 1. So the first. Generalization is what if I had more than what if x was not a zero one variable? If x was not a zero one variable, suppose x could take values one, two, and three, right? Then I could say, let me condition on x being one or two. Now it's binary. Now I can do what I got, construct bounds for beta. Now I can do the same condition on x being one and three, get bounds for beta. Condition on x being two and three, get bounds for beta. And so the true beta must be inside all of those bounds. <laughs> right? right? So I could do that. And here's a theorem that says if x has more than two points of support, it can be discrete or continuous or whatever. If it's one dimensional, just doing this conditional on two values and then intersecting all the bounds gives you the sharp identified set for beta. Kind of obvious given the rest, but I have kind of obvious given the rest. And if there was nothing else coming, I wouldn't even have told you this because it's kind of boring. But it's just an obvious observation, right? So, okay, all right. Um, what about the case where, there mo where there's more than one explanatory variable? That's kind of the interesting case, right? Um, and so here we will think about this is a vector. This is a vector again. Gamma is only identified up to scale. Um, I will, so I need to normalize gamma for presentation purposes, but I, th I think this is also true in general, right? I'm going to think about one of the elements of beta being the parameter of interest. So let's just say it's beta 1. We want to know what is the effect of x1 on the first extensor variable controlling for the other x's, right? But I like to derive bounds for everything, but just for presentation purposes, I'll think about what can I say about beta 1, right? And I, since I need to normalize gamma, I'll normalize the first element of gamma to be 1. Okay? Good. All right. Again, right, and we will, again, so this is a sample selection model. We'll assume that epsilon and nu is independent of the x's. So the mean of y conditional on being observed is x beta plus some, fun some function of set gamma. And then, what we will do, there will be two steps to the argument then. There will be two steps to the argument. One is that first I will argue that when you think about beta, beta is a vector. It lives in RK. What I'll, the first thing I'll show is that the identified region for beta is actually just a line segment in RK. Okay. So that's nice theoretically, but also really nice practically, right? Because RK is awfully big, right? And so, um, so it's just a line segment, and then, and then I will derive bounds for. So that means that it's really there's a sense in which the non-identification is just one-dimensional, and then I'll derive bounds for that dimension. All right. All right. So, um, this there equation six is the equation from before. The mean of the observed y's is x beta plus some function of x gamma. That means that if I look at the mean of y, 
conditional on x gamma and subtract that, oops, oops. If I look at the mean of y conditional on x gamma, that's going to be the mean of x1 conditional x gamma times beta 1 plus the mean of x2 conditional x gamma beta 2 plus the mean of g of x gamma conditional x gamma, but that's just g of x gamma. So if I subtract, if I subtract the mean of y given x gamma, I get this equation here. The sample selection term disappears. All right? So I get this equation here. Now, it's completely trivial, and I had it on my slides until two days ago, but I took it out because every time I've done this, I've screwed it up. It's trivial first probability course exercise to show that the mean of x, uh, that x1 minus the mean of x1 given x gamma is equal to this. Okay. Just take my word for it. It, it, and it, is it really is trivial. It's just I screw it up every time I say it. So, um, okay. So what I'm going to do is I am, right, and again, gamma here. I've normalized the first element to be 1, and then the remaining elements is what I call gamma 2. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to take this and stick it in there and just rewrite three times. Okay, okay. so here, stick it in. This term is the same as this term. So I get x2 minus the expected value of x2 given x gamma multiplied by beta 2 minus gamma 2 beta 1. Right? So I'll call this guy here alpha 2. Right? So I've written it like this. Of course, I have data on y. y is the observed y. So I, can, so I have data on y. I can estimate gamma. So let's pretend I know it. So I can calculate the, so I can estimate the mean of y given x gamma. So I have data in principle on the left hand side. And I have data on this, right? I know x2, I know gamma, so I can estimate this guy here. So I can estimate the left hand side and estimate the right hand side, and then I can regress, and then I can recover alpha 2. In other words, I can recover alpha 2. I already know gamma. So what that says is if I knew beta 1, I know alpha 2. Suppose I knew beta 1, well, I already know gamma. Well, then I would know beta 2. So that's why the magnification problem is one dimensional. If I knew beta 1, I would be done. Right? Then I could estimate everything. Right? So now the game just becomes let's construct bounds on beta 1. Right? Right? And so now I'm going to run with. This is just copying and pasting again. It's boring, but I need it. Here it is, right? This was the original equation. Alpha was beta 2 minus this, so beta 2 is just this. Let alpha is, again, alpha is the guy I can estimate. So let's pretend I know it. I can estimate it, so let's pretend I know it. So let me look at this equation here. Let me subtract x2 alpha from both sides. Uh, right, so then I get this on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side I get x1 beta 1 plus x2 gamma 2 beta 1, so I get this expression here. Now again, gamma I can estimate, so I can, pretend, so I can estimate this. Okay, so you say, okay, so what? Well, so now, this is now a sample selection model where this is the dependent variable. It's not always observed, but it's a, right, so that's why it's a sample selection model. This is a dependent variable. This is the explanatory variable. This is one dimensional because it's x gamma. But I already told you how to construct a bound if you have a sample selection model where you have one explanatory variable. So now I can construct a bound on beta 1. Just by going back to the slide before that I said was boring, but I needed it. I know how to construct a bound if I have a one-dimensional explanatory variable. And now I do, because I can estimate alpha 2. I can estimate gamma. So I can think about this as the dependent variable, and this is the explanatory variable. OK, so here it is. And now we know what the identified region is. And then what we do in the paper is we prove that this is sharp 
in the sense that, it, I'll say it formally, but, but, it, it, but it says exactly what the thing says. Right? So the formal statement is, for any, okay, given the distribution of the data that you observed, for any beta in this region here, there's an underlying distribution of epsilon, of epsilon and nu that gives you exactly what you observe. So any beta in there could be the truth, okay? And then there is a, another theorem which is, sounds the same, but it's a little bit different, I think, which says that, so this says, for any beta in the set, there is a distribution that, that rationalizes it, but then there's another one that says, if the set is empty, then, there is, then the model could not be correct there would be no beta and distribution of epsilon and gamma that would give you what you observed. So, so you can also think about this as a test of your model if the identified set is, is empty. All right? All right. Um, now, these are statements about, right, these are statements about probabilities to make them into something you can actually try to implement and do inference. Um, it's going to be five more minutes, I think. So. Um, yeah. Four more slides. To make this into something I can estimate, right? you could say, well, let me try to estimate these probabilities. It turns out that there's a big literature out there on moment inequalities. And so I'm going to turn these probabilities into moments. right? And you just say, well, I'm just going to create. If I'm looking at the probability of, of some event, if I define a variable to be 1 if the event is, happens and 0 otherwise, then the probability is just the expected value of that variable. So I can turn these probabilities into expectations. right? So I can turn this into a statement about expectations. Expectations that must hold. Right? And then I, I can turn them into expectations. Also, this is something that must hold for all gamma 1 less than gamma 2. You forget where that came from. It came from back when I said, suppose I have an explanatory variable. It's not binary. I can condition on two values. Then if it becomes binary, then it's kind of like it was a zero or one variable, and then I can construct bounds. So that's where that comes from. So, okay. But of course, this has, has to hold for all gamma psi 1 less than psi 2. So it has to hold conditional on x gamma in some set where all the elements of this are less than all the elements of this. That sounded really complicated. It's not. It's completely true. So don't worry about it. Okay, so I can turn these statements into statements about mo moments, moments that you know, inequalities are moments, and then there's a big literature on how do you turn moment inequalities into estimators and how do you do inference. To be completely honest, we have nothing new to say about that. We just go in and read some survey paper where people say, well, here's what you do, and here's one thing you can do, and that's what we do. All right? So in particular, right? Of course, if I wanted to, so the point is, the true beta must satisfy this moment here. That's, that was the point of our paper. That's a contribution of our paper. The true beta, one must satisfy this. And then if I knew the true beta one, then I would know the remaining betas. Okay. So, right, so you, what you do is you estimate this, you estimate this, you look at the difference. If the estimate of this is less than the estimate of this, then that's consistent with the model. If the estimate of this is above the estimate of this, that's evidence against the model. So you look at, so you, so you just say, oh, this minus this, if it is negative, then you square it, and that gives you a loss function, and then you maximize that loss function, okay? That's what we did, that's what this is, okay? All right, um, and so taking the empirical example that we, looked at before the effect of being Mexican-American in the four states that border Mexico in the US. This is the objective function for females. This is the objective function for the males. And if there was no estimation error, the true beta would be the set of values for which this is equal to zero. And I should have said here, right, here, the, we've included a whole bunch of other explanatory variables, like I think there are like 10 explanatory variables plus time dummies. So there's like a 
a lot of exp uh, additional explanatory variables. But here we're just focusing on, there's the x2, all the other explanatory variables, but we're focusing on x1, a dummy variable for being Mexican American. Okay. So this would be our estimate, the set of values where this is equal to zero. Same over here for the men. And this is the critical value. So the 95, which I will, I'm happy to tell you afterwards where it came from, but it's not our contribution, so I don't want to emphasize it. We're just taking other people's results. This is the critical value function, and the 95% and the confidence interval then for the effect of being Mexican-American for men would be the interval from like here to here. And over here is the interval from here to here. It's any value for which the sample objective function is above the critical value. Right? And what I, want, what I want you to take away from this graph here, kind of you, if you only want to remember one slide, I want you to remember this slide. Because, and what I want you to remember is that, okay, we are, what we are trying to do is, we want to go back to the Heckman sample selection model. We want to relax the normality assumption. We want to not make distributional assumptions. But we want to acknowledge that we often don't have exclusion restrictions. All right? And in that case, you cannot point identify beta, but you can construct bounds. And what I want you to take away from this is that these bounds here, right? So, and when you look at then, and then you can construct bounds, and then you can turn those into an estimation procedure and construct confidence intervals. And at the end of the day, when you look at these confidence intervals here, Sure, they're smaller than the confidence interval you would have done if you assumed normality. That's not too, too surprising, right? But they're not that huge, right? And but in particular, they're not bigger. You know, this interval here is kind of the same magnitude as the confidence interval that you would have gotten if you had used Heckman's two-step estimator, right? All right. Um, so this is so. Hopefully, that that. The signal I want you to take from that is that this is potentially useful. Like it's like, in terms of getting confidence intervals, it is as useful as using Heckman's two-step estimator, but you're assuming much less. Okay? And then as a curiosity, right, you look at these and you say, you know, it's a good thing that I relaxed the normality assumption, right? Because if the normality assumption was correct, then maximum likelihood and Heckman's two-step estimator should both be consistent. But when you look at the confidence intervals for them, they're quite far apart. So that suggests strongly that the normality, that that's strong evidence against the normality assumption. So, so the other thing here is yes, it's worthwhile. Okay. All right. Now, um, so, okay. So in terms of the paper, right? This, that's it, right? So that that's it. In terms of the of the project, right? It's clear when you think about the. I, I said we didn't really contribute to the inference. We just looked at what other people did. But it's clear there are other things you can think about doing, right? Because there is, um, just like when you do GMM, you want to give different weight to different moment conditions, and maybe we, we should have done that too. Um, there, are these, there are all these parameters, the gamma and the alpha. But for those, you actually know the asymptotic distribution. We didn't use that when we did our inference, so maybe you could have simplified everything by no incorporating that knowledge into the construction of the confidence intervals. So there, are, there is that kind of thing, uh, kind of theoretical things in the spirit of this paper that could have been better or could have been extended. Then in terms of applications, one thing, so the data that we took is actually nice, so that's why we looked at it. But when you look at a bunch of data sets, you download them, people have these whys, and you think, you read the paper and you think this is like a continuous variable, often it actually is not, right? And so in particular, this, these test scores here, they're like integers between 1 and 36. And so these plotting densities and stuff like that is not so great, right? And, um, and actually, if you look at David Lee's paper, if, not if you look at the, at the paper, you'd have no clue. But if you ask him for his data and you get it, and you do like a start you know, opening up an Excel spreadsheet and data and look at the data, you know why it only takes like six or seven values or something like that. It's Hugely discretized. So one thing you could do here is also start thinking about, you know, suppose this was like the underlying why and you did all of this, but then on top of that, the observed why has been discretized and then that would give you some, you know, slightly wider bound. So there's something, so in practice, to make this 
for some empirical applications, something like that might be useful. Okay. Um, there's also, I didn't say this, but actually for gamma to be point identified, I need, you need to assume that there's at least one continuous x. <coughs> Otherwise, gamma is not point identified, you can, but you can bound it. But then what we'd have to do is for every point in the identified set for gamma, we would do this exercise, and then we take the union of all the bounds you've got. So, okay, so for, in practice, uh, for people who are more empirical, you, people who say, would say who are more empirical, who are doing like more modern program evaluation stuff would say, well, this is hopelessly old fashioned, right? Um, I'm assuming independence of the X's and the errors. You know, at least you'd want to allow for some heteroscedasticity or something like that, which I didn't. Um, also, you would want to, in this literature, right, people often don't talk about like the treatment effect. They talk about like an average treatment effect. And then, and then the question is, you know, so the question is how would we do that in this context here? We're trying to do some of that. There, the biggest problem is that once you allow for parameter heterogeneity, it becomes very unclear what the object of interest is. So in particular, David Lee writes his paper and it all sounds very good. And he comes up with these sharp bounds. But then at the end of the day, you go home and sleep on it and then you say, well, there are sharp bounds, but sharp bounds on what, right? And there are, in his case, there are sharp bounds on the average treatment effect for the individuals for whom y would have been observed whether x was equal to 1 or x was equal to 0. But then you ask yourself, under what conditions is that the interest? Under what conditions is that the policy relevant parameter, right? I mean, the answer is never. It's just what he happens to be able to figure stuff out about, right? So, so this, but anyway, it, it's clear, right? It's clear that we should, we, we have to make a link between what we're doing here and some of this stuff here. That's kind of like the next step, right? So when you think about filling out from like the 70s and 80s literature into the 2000s literature, like we're like, this paper is like in 91 and we need to fill it up until like 2002 or something like that. Right? There's a continuum of things you could do in there, so, okay. Good. Thank you very much. Sorry about the microphone and everything. I